Woof woof and namaste. This is Hill Dog and welcome to Kana Cast, a series of conversations with visitors and residents of Kana Shantivana, the International Center for Heartfulness. Today I'll be speaking to Brother Gyan Sarin. He is a management consultant and a long-time practitioner of heartfulness. He's also a heartfulness meditation trainer. For those of you who don't know, heartfulness is a meditation technique that is offered for free by volunteer trainers around the world. It was earlier known by the name Sahaj Marg or the natural path. One of the specialities of heartfulness is meditation with the transmission of a very subtle energy. Since there will be a lot of reference to heartfulness in this talk, let me just fill you in on the heartfulness guides. The first guide was Lala ji, then there was Babu ji, from 1983 to 2014 Chari ji was the heartfulness guide and uh, from 2014 to the present day Daji has been the heartfulness guide. A heartfulness meditation session is often called a sitting and a heartfulness meditation trainer is often called a preceptor. How long uh, brother Gan have you spent in the heartfulness practice doing the heartfulness practice? I started when I was in school. I was introduced to the system by one of my teachers. And so that makes it uh, that was March 1980. That makes it exactly how many years? 42. 42 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so how come you were interested in spiritual where do you think it started? that's another story uh see i this is another something and again very unusual about my childhood um you don't generally remember anything below 3 years of age you know so what i know of that phase the first 3 years of my life is from my mother largely my mother and my parents my other family people elders and uh, they told me that uh, while when i was 3 years old uh, that was my mother that i would you know ask for certain specific things always and it started by asking for some mithai before my meals i would say no i want a mithai before so she'll say yes you'll get a mithai what's the problem you eat your food first then you'll get your mitha but i would say no you put it before me and then i will have my meal i i remember this little conversation because uh, and my mother said what's wrong with you ye panditon ki tarah aapke pehle meetha i said i always start with the meetha so what do you mean i always start I said, that's how i eat my food she says where are you been eating here and then it seems i told her that i uh, you know i remembered my uh, it was as if i was living in that life i wasn't here it was a continuum from a past life and then i started to tell her that you know this is how i live this is how i eat this is what i do and uh, so that was a very startling thing for my family that uh, this fellow you know he's and i refused to believe i was i mean, not believe i mean i was behaving as if i was not a child 3 year old but i was that person of of that past life and uh, so my earliest recollections of my own Uh, this experience of remembering this past life was from let's say five to six years later. Prior to that, what I know, what I used to do is all from my mother. So I would actually uh, dress differently, and I would ask for a janeu that I need a janeu. I need a mandir here. I need these clothes. And in your family, this wasn't. Oh, it was except for my grandmother. You know, she, she was, was devout. she was devout, and she would you know she used to follow a very rigorous uh, practice. but the the others were just about like you know a lip service kind which you know they would come for some pujas have the prasad and that's it that is what uh, was for them and uh, non vegetarian staunchly fond of non vegetarian all of them so except my mother and grandmother so the ladies generally weren't but all the men folk my brothers everybody that was another difference i refused to uh, eat uh, any of that non vegetarian right from child right from childhood and uh, in fact there was an incident uh, which i recollect and which uh, uh, was very uh, you know again uh, revealing that uh, one of my aunts she said that you know how can this fellow not have meat i mean how is he going to like survive without meat and things like that so so you just have to make an effort and make him eat and then he'll get get started so she 
very cleverly she, my cousin her daughter she put the plates together you sweet and she put her plate next to mine and she started feeding both of us and uh, she took a chunk of meat with the roti from her plate and gave it to me and instantly i knew that it's uh, not what i you know uh, it it was so, and I, i i threw up wow and i created a ruckus you know <laughs> i remember that how old were you then probably 5 wow yeah because i remember this very clearly and i created a ruckus i said how dare you do this to me you know <laughs> irrespective of the fact that she was an elderly lady and as a, as a young child i couldn't have even spoken to her like that i was behaving like an old man and said how dare you do this to me you have defiled my uh, you know my religion and you have you know how you have how did you aapne kara kaise ye and you know dharm brushed ke dhast kar diya and and i started talking as she was also taken aback my father had to intervene and he said that bhai what is the problem i said if you do this kind of things to me i will not live here i will leave and that's when he got very concerned so he uh, and then and my mother they sat me down they started talking to me they said let's understand because and and they then took a decision not to attempt any more about this but i was very sick i kept throwing up didn't eat food uh, you know for the rest of the day <laughs> there's no point trying with this guy leave him alone so then started this you know revelation about the past life that i was a brahmin uh, not a brahmin but a a, 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 see, a non brahmin pandit probably now i mean i can make that distinction now but i used to at that point of time tell them that i was a pandit in a in in a temple in mathura and this was how i lived this is how i i live not that i lived mm-hmm. i am from there i am so and so and this is how i live so if you can keep me like that fine otherwise i'll find my way wow. my father said don't worry we'll give you what you want so i gave a list of things and uh, he sent somebody to get those things and everything was laid out a small temple was set up for me in the house i was given the janeu i was given the dhoti whatever uh, you know piece of cloth and very funnily i used to get up in the morning early hours and i said i will not have a bath in the bathroom i have a bath on a, and there was no i mean the you know the the what you call the kua was far off so they said no we can't allow you to go so early morning to the to the well why not a hand pump you know somebody will give you water from the hand and cold water in the morning i used to have this bath with mantras and then i started reciting mantras so they said why did you learn this i said this is what i you i do you know so this went on for about 2 years i think and then at the age of 7 i remember a lot of people came started coming and talking to me and you know they wanted to know ye kya and i was recounting the same story again and again again and again you know eventually my father said let's put a stop to this because this guy is going to you know either uh, get too much into it and he's stop people from meeting me about and talking to me about that and he specifically about there was this friend of his who was very keen to take me to mathura he said let's take him there and let's check out and let's see what you know this whole thing is about and but my father just put his foot down he said no more let him live his natural life and that's when i went went to st joseph's in nainital when i shifted to the school they started to reduce you know because he made sure that nobody talked to me about it and then i started to realize i'm in another life that you know and uh, that kind of weaning from that and movement into this started so up till then you felt it was the same life continuing. it was the same life continuing i didn't realize i was another i mean i i felt as if i was that person wow Wow. and i could describe the temple like my mother sometimes used to sit me down out of curiosity when it was just two of us and she would very lovingly ask me acha batao mujhe kya tha wo temple kya tha ye tha and i would graphically describe you know so um, she was quite convinced that you know it was and it was much much later that i went on my own to check out whether this was how far what i remembered was uh, there Uh, much later when i could travel on my own 
I quietly went, didn't tell anybody. And I realized that a lot had changed. It wasn't like what I remembered. You know, those images that I have of places were quite different now. And uh, I would estimate that the time lapse would be something like 200 to 250 years. I spoke to people there, tried to find out what was there, how this was earlier. So, you know, for instance, that Tulsi one, my image of that uh, one, uh, you know, that whole forest, there is nothing like a Tulsi one today. It's like all gone and you have a little bit of that uh, thing in, uh, you know, where the that they say the Ras Leela happens. Mm -hmm. A little patch left. Yes, yes, where nobody is supposed to go. Nobody is supposed night, to go. And night. Night. Now that, that entire area for kilometers, you know, several square kilometers was a Tulsi one. And you could only walk under the trees. And there were these passages, you know, going under the trees. And there was this huge... Can, not can, they were not very high trees, they are low trees. But there were these passages, very interesting things you could go into uh, them, you know, and they were shaded. So people used to play, children used to play, people used to cross over from one point to the other there. Just about enough height to walk through. So uh, those are all gone. There's nothing like that left now, except for that little patch. And uh, even the temple changed. So, so for me, this whole phenomena of uh, continuity of life is uh, something from my own real experience. experience. First hand experience. Yes. So you mentioned that 200 to 250 years is your estimation. Yes. And you went to Mathra perhaps after school, after? This was, I think, uh, yeah. So 250 years, uh, you are meaning from? Uh, Death in that life yes. to birth in to, this life. Yes, yes. Wow. So we have this concept of salvation, you know, where as I understood much later when I came into heartfulness that there is this difference between a liberation and salvation. And that salvation is only a gap. It's a longer gap. I mean, some people would be born instantly. Some people are in a state of salvation. And I, perhaps now, if I, you know, with my understanding of things now. Uh, uh, I think you have to wait for that next phase when your evolution can go on, when circumstances are created for your evolution to go further from where you are. You have to wait for those right circumstances. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it is our masters, <laughs> you know, this great uh, plan for me that uh, I was born and I came in touch with the system. Yeah, because the Heartfulness Guide Daji also mentions very often that the soul is attracted to the, to the vibration yes. that is ready. And perhaps uh, time is a very different concept uh, yes. yes, in the physical world and in the world where there is no yes. physical existence. Yes. So, so it's very interesting. And how? what about now? How much do you remember of your past life now? I remember, uh, see memories are there. But it's not with that kind of intensity and that kind of detail. Also, interestingly, you know, uh, one of our preceptors, I mean, the you know, Kasturi Benji again, uh, my mother told her about this. And uh, her first reaction was that don't intensify it. Because, you know, the memories of one lifetime are not enough to deal with. You add one more and, well, you know, so yeah. this there will be unnecessary burden on the child. So, <clears throat> that was one thing which... I heard, overheard and I said yes, that I don't need to really. The second was a very interesting incident uh, at Satkul about this. I had forgotten. Post my, you know, school, I became very deeply involved in, uh, in heartfulness. And uh, it was a very interesting journey because Babuji Maharaj was there and I was lucky enough to meet him. Very, very lucky, I should say. Just those two years, you know. And uh, I went completely, so much so, that one uh, day I realized that I hadn't even thought of going to a temple for the past. That was the very first year of my practice that, you know, I used to pass by the same temples and there was, it, as if I was passing by another building, you know, there was no interest at all. And I remember uh, recognizing this feeling in me that, you know, how is it that I, and there was a time. You know, the, I used to, every Tuesday, I used to go to the Hanuman temple in Nainital. And one Tuesday, 
at around nine o'clock in the night, I realized I hadn't been. It was Tuesday, and I had forgotten. I somehow must have mixed up the dates. Nine o'clock, it was. It was beginning to drizzle. I got up, and I said, "I will go." Everyone there, everyone was tucked up in bed, and they said, "What crazy fellow, you know? Why? <laughs> What's wrong with you?" Even my grandmother said, "Why don't you do something here? You, you don't need." To. I said, "No, I must go." Now that I remember, nine o'clock in the night, I went, came back drenched. But I did go, and from that to this change, where I am passing by the same temple, I don't even realize I am passing by that temple. So I remember noticing that change. So therefore, you know, this was one, and therefore, it completely wiped out this memory so much so that I, I think I almost forgot about it, till uh, many many years later, in Satkhol, Chari Ji was there, and uh, you know, I suddenly called in. And uh, he probably my elder brother spoke to him. It may have been in some context, and he told him that oh my brother also remembered his past life and things. So he immediately called me and he said, "Why didn't you tell me about it?" I said, "Sir, I actually, if you ask me, I forgot all about it. It didn't mean anything to me in the sense that uh, never there there was never a context where I could have said this to you and." Uh, so now that you know, I saying I suddenly rem remembered, and you know I had had this very strange feeling all through my childhood, from let's say till the age of fifteen or so, till I joined Heartfulness, I had a very strange feeling which I could not understand, and it would manifest in very different ways. For instance, let's say I'm in a very joyful environment. There's a wedding going on, and there's people dancing around, and there's Parting and everybody is involved. I just couldn't connect with that environment. And uh, it, it, the more of that happened, and the more detached I felt. And uh, it used to worry me because sometimes I used to feel so out of place. And uh, people used to feel that you know why am I not uh, participating. Getting, uh, participating? So it used to as a as a and uh, you know as a, uh, a young uh, uh, as a, let's say in my teens. That something which used to worry me, and I used to, but I couldn't get over this feeling, and I didn't know what it was. And I, when I reflected back, even in my childhood, I remember that feeling in a greater or lesser intensity always being with me, and I couldn't recognize it. And Chari ji called me, and he said, "Why didn't you talk to me about this?" I said, "Sir, didn't remember. You know, it just so happened that I." And he said, "He said, did you feel melancholic in your childhood?" I said, "That is it. You know, I used to have this feeling. I couldn't recognize, and I think it was this. I used to feel melancholic." And he just then he said, oh, "Okay, that was good." But he just completed that whole understanding of that, uh, you know, experience. And uh, when he said that. And we uh, well, he never didn't explain why uh, that was so, but I could then reflect back and remember why it must have been so. That I was very uh, disillusioned with religion. Uh, you know, I I was not. I used to have a Brahmin name, but I remember that I was from some kind of. Uh, You know uh, these uh, this class which was a uh, aristocracy, uh, not necessarily Brahmin, but I lived a Brahmin's life. I took to a Brahmin's life, and I went to this temple as a Brahmin because I felt that a Brahmin is by nature, not really by birth. And I think it was something like I was thrown out of the temple. I remember I could recollect that there was I couldn't recollect the exact incidents. But I remember that I was very, very disgusted and disillusioned with the life of the these people there who were running the temple, and I took all, took them on, and they saw to it that I was removed from there. And I remember that for the later part of that, my, my you know my uh, age, uh, late uh, you know this um, later part of my life, I lived somewhere in a hut, sort of a structure, very basic structure. And uh, uh, it was uh, in a, in a kind of a semi-forested area away from town, and I lived a very reclusive life. I had no children. I had a wife who was left behind, but no children. 
and it was a life of uh, just uh, uh, exasperation that you know after having done so much and after having i actually didn't ar arrive at anything i was left seeking uh, that seeking uh, was um, not at all satisfied and uh, my last memory of that life is that i passed away reading some book probably a ramayan and i just you know i bent over and lay down on that book and passed out and i also remember uh, my thoughts about the wife that how would she now manage i am going which you recall the yes thought of leaving, leaving the body leaving the body and leaving her behind so you know and possibly that could have led to the melancholy so there was this pain of uh, departure because of the memory of no the i think this uh, disillusionment with what i had done all my life and not having got anywhere this illusion with the system there that you know um, the way they were and in those days i think there was a lot of corruption even 300 years ago even 300 years ago and that was a time i suppose when um, these were isolated places you know because of uh, the, the the political thing in place in the sense mm -hmm. you couldn't very openly um i do religious things but um probably the end of the mughal era a period of lot of confusion everywhere yes yes so yes. every one of these places acting independently and uh, you know so i think that whole um uh, i would say <clears throat> not having achieved much that seeking not being satisfied having uh, you know to leave this uh, lady behind it must have led to some kind of melancholy which manifested in an, see that you wouldn't know that's why you don't know the reason why it manifests but you know the feelings for sure and that's how i understood very clearly how this whole pattern of sanskars works that there are no specific uh, context but the feelings are there they manifest and then they lead you into a certain direction so um um after that i think everything just became more of a uh, matter of research for me on my own experience mm -hmm. it doesn't impact me in that sense the way it did earlier and um you remember the time of mortality i think a lot of us are very concerned in the sense that there's so much uh, literature about death and so much uh, you know there's so much fear associated with that was there a fear also of no. at that moment no fear there was no fear. Uh, no fear and uh, maybe that is what led to this whole period of you know hmm. grace where i was waiting for the next process to start but i also remember the the devotion that i had at that time you know i felt very very uh, devoted and I, even today uh, you know the ramayan uh, it brings tears very many things you know i cannot uh, i cannot hear these things when it makes me uh, very emotional so that something again uh, you know which is um, i don't know why mm. i mean i mean you know these are now characters i know for uh, so long and yet if i come you know if i go through this whole process where we, let's say i'm watching a tv serial on that or i'm reading even reading the ramayana somebody is reciting it it evokes something and that's a vestige of well uh, so do you remember if uh, since you are mentioning the ramayana <clears throat> but mathura is associated with uh, krishna more more yes. with krishna 
Yes. But uh, were you more of a Ram Bhakt at that time? No, I thought? was just a seeker. Just a seeker. It wasn't. So much. it was just that I found, uh, you know, I was trying to understand these personalities. So Krishna, of course, uh, you know, because I was in the Dwarkadish temple. But that whole environment uh, sort of pushed me into a, a, a broader research. And uh, I mean, in in the in Hinduism, we know that uh, in the in, uh, there's this concept of avatar. So uh, you don't differentiate. If you really can mm -hmm. get to the essence, you know that it's the same essence manifesting. And that I remember. That is why I was probably after that phase of being with the Krishna tradition, I was maybe studying this other thing. Wow, that's very interesting. And uh, are the memories associated even now? Are they Personal, or do you remember things about the polity and the economy of that time? I mean, mundane stuff, or just the they're history. more personal. They're more personal because I think I wasn't really concerned much about the rest of the world. I was very focused on mm. this uh, seeking, and uh, those are the nuances of that. Those experiences I remember more than the rest of it what life was like and that, that sort of thing is not? Very little, mm. very little from my own thing. But I was definitely living uh, for the for the good later part of my life, I was living completely as a recluse. In isolation. In isolation. Now, the Gyan, when you are in this life with all these memories, one would think it would be extremely difficult to adjust to modern life in the sense that now you, you know, you've, have these memories of a lifetime of spiritual search and where at the end you feel you have not reached anything. So the temptation would be there to resume the search again rather than uh, get involved in the mundane affairs of life. Was that a problem? Was that a problem adjusting? For a while. But I was, I would say, very, very fortunate that uh, uh, the system found me. I don't think I had the wherewithal. If I had such, the only thing I remember doing was, uh, you know, as advised by um, Yoganandji in that book, he said that each for each one in nature, I mean, nature designates a guru for each one, and according to your thinking, and uh, if you pray, the guru will come to you. So I said, let me, you know, just as an experiment. I remember that I all I was doing it before going to sleep. I would say, "Okay, let him come to me." And he actually did, you know. So, apart from that little prayer, I don't think I had the wherewithal to have reached this system. It found me, and probably um, uh, had that not happened, that adjustment would have been far more difficult. As I said, one adjustment took place at the age of seven, eight, nine. When I moved out of that continuum into a new life, and I recognized that I was some you know, in this life now, so that was one switch over which happened, and uh, with some difficulty, but it happened. The second happened very smoothly, because you know, in heartfulness, we know this entire thing that life is a continuum. So it it just that understanding clicked into place the moment I read Babuji's those five books, you know. Which is all that we had. Most of it was that only at that time when I joined. Those were the core books, which still are, but there wasn't all this much of literature that we have now today. So uh, the very first time that I read them, everything fell into place, and uh, I realized that uh, you know this whole concept of balancing the material and the uh, and the spiritual side was very attractive to me. In the sense that I was. Uh, I think I definitely had this inclination that I am not going to go into the material side. That I am going to continue with my seeking and I uh, could have, been, in fact my father was very, uh, very apprehensive that I will one day leave and uh, maybe take up sannyas or something. Yeah. Become a so, yes, so that is why he would discourage anyone talking to me about past <laughs> life or any of these things. He will cut short all those conversations say enough now, you know, do not take him back into this. He told me later that he used to be very concerned that I might just go away one day. So that switchover 
was more than what I could have asked for. That whole understanding of how you need, to, and possibly that is what no, had not happened in the in the previous experience, mm -hmm. you know, the previous phase of seeking, which I could then uh, uh, you know understand, and and of course uh, Chariji, uh, you know, with whom I had more of my mentoring. You know, that phase was more with him as a he truly. Um, brought about this understanding that excellence in both sides is equally important and he would always see to it that you know he would always concern what are you doing how are your studies going what are you what exams do you intend to do? so you know all of these things he would discuss and uh, in fact through the first phase of my employment also i used to keep telling him there was this one uh, thing which i took up which i was not really agreeing with me and uh, he to he said that look a job is a job. Primary purpose is livelihood. Do this until you find the next one. Mm -hmm. You can't just go by, you know, this doesn't suit me. You need to be employed. You need to get going with life. And this is something you need as a basis for the other life, you know, as a support system for the other life. So that concept, you know, that understanding luckily came at the right time. I didn't struggle and waste time. So you know, at that, let's say at the age of 20, 20 to 24, he very clearly, uh, you know, and he monitored. Whenever we would meet, he would ask, you know, what are you doing now and what is this and how are you pairing with your job? How are you? So, even with marriage, for that matter, you know, mm. so, uh, he saw to it that uh, you know, we don't uh, get into that imbalance. You know, I had this conviction once I read the five books, whatever, I think I understood very little of it at that time. I don't think I understood the way I understand now. And we all keep growing in that understanding, ever growing understanding. But uh, let's say when I entered college uh, and uh, I was well into, let's do about two years of being in the system, I'd read these books. I was very convinced that uh, this is uh, the best that I know. I, so far, I've, this is the best that I've discovered. But uh, as uh, you know, our system, it does not stop you from exploring. That's a beautiful aspect of the system, you know, that it never says that this is the end and uh, you should never look beyond. And uh, looking at uh, Chariji, uh, himself. He was intellectually a giant. He had read so much, you know, whenever you sat with him, he would talk about what he had read and, and that sort of opened up the horizon for me that, you know, you, sh you can explore. So, I used to read, uh, I got reading, uh, I uh, read a lot of, uh, you know, psychology of, uh, you know, whatever he used to talk about, I used to go back and read. If he spoke of Jung, I would go back and find that book. He spoke of Freud, I'll pick up that and try and read. And uh, for that matter, Eric Burns, you know, games people play. He mentioned that. I said, let me read that. And so that's how my progression of, uh, you know, that intellectual expansion happened alongside. So I would read them with the view that how does it, how does it vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis our own system uh, I would used to try and place it somewhere, you know, to make mm. an assessment that, okay, is it, and I would always invariably come to the conclusion that uh, it's nowhere near uh, our philosophy, you know, or our depth of the thought process that is there in our system. Um, and But I used to just compare. And I used to read it more for curiosity than for seeking. Mm. The seeking stopped. And it was a more very joyful exploration then you know so i explored many many things at that time but not with a seeking but just to understand what they are and how does it sort of relate with our system there was no uncertainty in that no all. uncertainty it was a very joyful exploration of what else exists not looking for something but just sure. you know exploring and as a as a youngster also inspired by chariji's own example of, you know, that he knew so much about everything else mm -hmm. other than just the system. So,
so each time he would you would talk to him or heard his talks there was an inspiration to look at something and and uh, and that also stopped after some time you know when you got into a job there were different concerns so it it was for let's say those 4 5 years of college and uh, where i really and that understanding stays with me i think it was very helpful because you are able to understand your own system and what you are doing and your own exp- experiences in a much better perspective if you know i mean if you keep this in isolation you would never be able to appreciate it so much so true so true now you met babuji when you were in school the first meeting with babuji and this was at kitcha at uh, chaudhry harpal singh's farm yes it was a very very profound uh, uh, experience yeah, we were about 10 or 12 of us in all in all in all kitcha at the farm at that And time babuji. that evening when he arrived wow but uncle had given us instructions i think he had given instructions to people that when he arrives this is how you must line up this is how you must receive babuji no one is going to touch his feet or interrupt him you know come forward just stand on the sides let him pass through and you can wish him and that's exactly what we did we saw the car coming in from you know from you can see from far you know yes yes and yes. that where the garages are today uh, you know just in front of that garage there is that space so we all lined up five this side and five this side and and babuji maharaj reception could, committee yes reception committee and we i could see him i still remember that sight you know when uh, the car turned and i could see the front of the car and i could see babuji sitting in the front seat along with uncle and uh, and he came down and then uh, you know we all wished him he wished us you know with folded hands just walked past us and he went into that room is still there but it was a room made of asbestos at that time that house was in there mm-hmm. so just a couple of you know uh, shed shed like, yes, yes actually and in one of the sheds he was to stay and uh, he went in and uh, uh, you know freshened up and all and the uh, his uh, chair was put outside in the lawn and uh, his hookah was uh, placed there soon after and then after and we sat around that chair and i sat right uh, in the corner you know to the chair that uh, you know if uh, babuji would come he wouldn't actually i wouldn't see him face to face it will be on i was on the side on the i think right hand side immediate side sitting there and of course he came out in his you know in his that short sleeved um, he used to wear and uh, he came and sat down relaxed started smoking the hookah nothing was said and i was looking at him intently like this you know on from the sides because his side face was uh you know i could see and i'm just looking at him like that and you know just and he suddenly turned and he looked into my eyes maybe 5 seconds and uh it was something very intense it was as if he had seen me through and through you know shook me up and there was a vibration right across you know it was and uh, um, again i didn't know what was happening you know but it was something and he just turned looked like like this and he looked back and but i remember something a feeling coming into me at that time after a while when we got up from there and i had heard people say that you know babuji can uh, you know just by his look he can do what he has to do and uh, i felt that that was it whatever he had to do for me he did in that look and even today i feel that whatever is manifesting you know it's it's a it's a Uh, is a consequence of that it's a resultant of that you know it's just manifesting and what he had to do at that time there is nothing close to that i couldn't have imagined anything like that i've never experienced that kind of thing again that uh, you know uh, except the feeling you know every time then of course our successive masters 
I think it put me into a totally different uh, dimension. It was like uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, there was, as I said, even from the first few sittings, there was no seeking. There was no more seeking. I only wanted to seek what more is there in the system rather than Explorers. look at it, whether this is good for me or not, or whether, you know, whether I, like for instance, I was doing Gayatri, I was doing these other systems. There was something uh, which was still lacking. You know, I was felt that I'm not fully uh, there's still something I want to know and, and uh, experience more. But that went. And with this was a totally different, I think, uh, I didn't even realize probably the complete impact of that. But I knew something very major has happened. Mm -hmm. Something very, very profound has happened. And uh, just by going by the sheer physical manifestation of that experience. That itself was something very profound. Leave alone the, the spiritual uh, aspect of it. So I knew that has happened. And thereon, after that, I think a great enthusiasm came. And uh, I was not just practicing myself. I was talking about it to everybody. Great, so, great. But thank you so much. Thank you so much thank you. It was for a, taking out time. And it was a great uh, journey back. Down memory lane. Down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this will definitely have to have a part two. Or maybe even a part three, who knows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So that was my conversation with Brother Gyan Sareen. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. To hear more such conversations, please subscribe to this channel and also you can find us on Spotify on the KanaCast channel. That is K-A-N-H-A-C-A-S-T. Thank you for listening. This is Hilldog signing off. Woof woof. <laughs>